and with that, I will answer a few questions if I have any time left. Thank you. Why, yes, I happen to know Chris Mooney very well. Yes, I'm on his enemies list. I think I'm near the yeah, top. Okay. Yeah. Those of you who don't know him here, Chris Mooney is a fairly well-known journalist in the United States. He's a science journalist, and he's an atheist and agnostic. And he's very irritating. And he did a book recently with a woman, I can't remember her name. And you went to the title Cheryl Kirschenbaum. Yes, Unscientific America. Yeah, and what I did was, the first thing I did is I went to this book, and looked at they had a whole chapter on why what um, Dr. Myers and I and Dawkins and Dennett, et cetera, are doing is wrong. It's horrible. It's destroying atheist cons. First thing I did was I just went to the chapter, looked for all the citations they had from the research. Nothing. All the footnotes, just sheer sure opinion. Mm -hmm. So it's a really irritating thing. But what I'm thinking about with this is that perhaps there's this, apparently this movement to get this declaration out of this conference that we should talk about this thing. And put into some of the things you're talking about of why we should, uh, the, the ethical issues and also the practical issues. And also, the term militant atheist is a, really, is a problem, and for the reason you're talking about, it, it's just plain wrong. I don't like the term new atheism, partly because new atheism, I think, is when scientific atheism came in the 1800s, but it also doesn't really yeah. say anything. So the term I like is assertive atheism. Right. Getting out there, you know, we're in people's spaces. Um, not being militant, we're just basically saying the truth. So I guess I just wanted to get this, this, I was just thinking about this, so I wanted to throw this out there to something that maybe we could do. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, and, and it's, 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 it's entirely the point I'm making, that, is that um, we're not militant, we're honest. And like you say, assertive is another good word. And uh, that what we're doing is merely expressing our views strongly and vigorously, and the appropriate response from the other side would be to uh, refute them. Why don't they trot out Jesus for us or something? Or, or whatever thing they think is necessary to demonstrate the existence of their deity. But they don't. Instead, they prefer to tell us that, uh, you know, as you mentioned, that we are harming the cause somehow because, again, we are, we are disquieting the yeah, audience. Evan Solis, but the data that is out there doesn't indicate that anything, what we're doing, helps out. It's the same with, you know, Blacks in the United States. They got a sermon. That's how they, they, they won the right. That's right. Like, so maybe what I guess I say is maybe we should try to actually use this conference to change the terminology and start using a certain atheism. Yes, yeah, so I, I think if you, if you talk to all the people who write about atheism, you know, uh, Dawkins, myself, uh, some of the other people here, uh, you'll find that we all dislike the term new atheism. We're just sort of going along with it because that's, that's what the media has labeled. Yeah, and, and so an alternative would be great, uh, but please not something like Bright's. You know, it just, I think there are some differences in how modern atheists are responding. They're being a little bit more aggressive and outgoing about it, uh, but we're not trying to pretend that we're smarter than other people. Uh, Ken Miller, I've said, he's a bright guy. He really knows his stuff. Uh, it's just that there's this little addled corner of his brain that's got God wedged in there, and I think it's interfering with the flow of, of electrons or something. My name is Uwe Kirschman. Thank you very much for your lecture. I like especially you, when you stated we are not atheists enough. Because yes. I think uh, there's really a tendency in any group like this group here that what we are saying, thinking, turns into a belief system, no matter what. Also, regarding people who say this is good science, they turn into a belief system. And like you said, you said that man, we have had man here on this planet of 200,000 years. 
Yes. That is sort of accepted by all good scientists, right? But it's accepted because the evidence is what, what that says. I mean, there's, there's <laughs> molecular genetic evidence, there's fossil. What's the evidence? Like, I attended a lecture here in town a half a year ago by an American researcher called Michael Primo. And he has research into archaeology, uh, really uh, done by archaeologists like 100 years ago, 50 years ago, and people who, go, who have come up with results uh, which are controversial. And that's, they get fired from that department if they find something which suggests that man has been on this planet for a longer time. And he, he says what he has looked into this archaeology, archaeology uh, research, which is fine, good science by these standards, that man has been here on this planet for millions of years. And there are clear uh, facts to, to support that. But you're, you're speaking is, of okay, modern humans, like Homo sapiens. Is, is been, been, Homo sapiens, yeah. Uh, with our feet, etc. Making footprints like I do here uh, hundreds of, uh, or many million years ago. Yeah. Well, I, I, would, I, would, I would go back to Darwin right here. That what Darwin says is, is do good service by conscientiously expressing your convictions. Uh, when I say that, that the human species is 200,000 years old, I am going by the available evidence. I am stating it firmly, and I'm not going to waffle and say, oh, maybe it's 200,000 years old. I'm going to sta state it very clearly that, yes, I think on the basis of the evidence that humans have been here for 200,000 years. Uh, what is then expected is that anybody who wants to argue with me will present the evidence. And then if their evidence is better than my evidence, as a good critical thinker, I will change my mind. So I'd say to this, this person that you better have darn good evidence, because that's a pretty wild idea that most people are going to reject on the basis of, of other avail available facts. But yeah, there's a possibility. It just seems bizarre to an extreme, but OK. Show me the evidence. Mantra of the scientist. Yeah. Just a brief aside on that, Michael Kremer is a known creationist um, who got his so-called PhD from uh, Hare Krishna, I think, university somewhere. Oh, yes, Cremo, uh, yes. A uh, separate order of what he wants to accomplish. He's working together with creationists in Denmark all over the world, actually. And his is uh, yes. slightly different. I mean, Christian creationists say it's a couple of thousand. They say millions or billions, actually. So. It's a right. Agenda, I would say. Yes, uh, and, but again, what you see there is is the distorting effects of religion. Uh, Michael Cremo is is somebody who's got these very strange ideas. Like you said, that humankind has been here for millions and billions of years, and uh, it, it all ties back into this this idea of cycles of existence and so forth. Uh, he's got no evidence for any of that. Uh, what it is is an assertion based on his particular superstition, and, and it does not qualify as, as science. So he by... the evidence that he Yeah, did. yes, yes. You see, uh, you triggered a, a question about love. I consider loving someone, uh, helping enhance the other one to grow and develop himself or herself. Therefore, for that, you need knowledge how to do that. And uh -huh. with a difficult word for knowledge is science. It isn't the conclusion that only science makes love possible. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's all chemistry. No. Um, yeah, the, you know, the, the, what we would say as scientists is that, that love is, is mind and physiology that we can measure hormones, we can measure physiological responses, uh, that love is not built out of the absence of knowledge of the other, that love is something that grows from information, that as you get to know somebody and you find compatibilities, you find similar uh, likings, then, then it can bloom into love. So yeah, I would say that uh, love is an entirely natural process. I'm quite happy with it. Uh, and we don't need to invoke anything supernatural to explain it. Uh, I'm Nick Gotts uh, from Aberdeen, Scotland. Um, I'd like to make a distinction, which, um, see what you think of it, between uniqueness of origin on the one hand, which, as you showed, we don't have. We, we originate in the same way as all the rest of life. Yes. And 
uniqueness of causal power. We, unlike any other extant species, could actually bring it down the curtain on the whole ancient drama. In well, now, then in 50 years. And so yeah. it's a uniqueness of responsibility. Um, I'm, I'm not saying anything that, that contradicts what you're saying. Right, yes, no, I, I, I know. I, 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 would just, I, would just, I just kind of disagree with it because, uh, yes, we can do horrible things. You know, we can, we can blow ourselves up, we can poison the environment, we can make it very unsatisfactory for us to leave, live. But I don't think we have it in the power to completely change the ecosystem. That, yes, we could, we could drive ourselves into extinction in the next century. And if you came back in your magic time machine 500 years from there, you'd have a hard time knowing we even existed. Uh, and, and the world would bounce back. That, and I would, I would also say that we can't argue that we are unique that, unique that way because in the Precambrian seas, I think blue-green algae did far more to change the environment, uh, replacing the, the carbon dioxide saturated mess that we had before with yeah, something I, I, which- I wasn't proposing to put us above blue-green algae. I think. Okay. <laughs> yes, they, they are our lords and masters. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Causal power that they have. But, um, we, we do have a, a more conscious ability to change our environment. Uh, I, I would, my only quibble there is that we can make conscious decisions to change parts of the environment, but often the environment doesn't cooperate and we get surprises. You know, things like, oh, we'll just, we'll just pump out lots of oil and have lots of energy for free. And no, we, it turns out there are consequences that we couldn't predict that are doing well, that. Right. Right. But the effects of, what we, of doing what we do for other reasons. Yeah, and, and the, the, I hate to argue with you. I'm, I'm mostly agreeing with you. But there, the, uh, you know, the other thing to think about is, is you know, there, there's this principle of niche construction that every organism is doing this. Every organism is modifying its environment around it to better suit its lifestyle. And we are doing the same thing. It's just that we are social animals. We have large communities of, of large beasts like us. And we are having a greater magnitude of effect on the environment yeah, around us. We, we rank somewhere above most, uh, well, between most current species and the blue Yes, we're, we're somewhere in there, yeah. Great, well, thank you. Thank you.